Got a big push. CPI came in. And yet, it washed us out towards the open. Washed us out all day long yesterday. What's going on out there, Bulls? Do the Bulls have control? Are the Bears stepping back in? Will Jerome Powell come in and pow this market down today? Or will this actually be a positive for the market? Let's talk about it with Dennis Dick. And of course, we got our guest today excited to have, of course, Tracy Reineck, Senior Equity Strategist at Zach's Investment Research. Let's get into it, team. Rise and shine. It's pre-market prep time. Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Conan. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I'm bidding a penny. I'd buy that stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. All right, team, let's get right into the action. Of course, uh, I'll bring on Dennis and we'll take a look at the markets and see what we got in the action. Looks like overnight action, just straight sideways. Look at look look at this, just sideways. It's almost yeah. like it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, so there's not much to talk about that overnight action. Yesterday, of course, that big downturn. We'll talk about that with Dennis, uh, but let's take a quick look, see how kind of silver is doing right now still. Kind of slowly creeping back. Uh, gold also kind of doing the same thing, kind of pulling on back here. So not much I see there. Let's go to the oil. Oil getting a little bit of a spike today. Could also take a look, uh, at least a peek towards WTI. Um, but like always, we're going to keep watch to see if oil can get a little bit of a bounce. It's up today right now. I saw a little bit of a spike in the 4 a.m. up towards around 76.17 for WTI. Now at around 75. 79. We'll see if it can get back to 80. That's an important level. But if we go back down towards the 70 levels, of course, that's going to be a good thing for inflation continuing coming down. Let's talk about what happened yesterday. It was a crazy day as we got that spike on CPI. Went up as high as 414, yet we came crashing right back down. What did you see, Dennis? I was very concerning. Like, I think it was almost a worst case scenario for the Bulls. And I tweeted that out yesterday. I mean, we got what we wanted. Like, the Bulls got what they wanted. The CPI data was light. The huge rip up to 414 in the pre market, which is crazy. The 410, we talked about that resistance point. And we're like, well, this is the first logical spot where they need to get it through. And I thought maybe mm-hmm. there's room to 420. Not yesterday, but I thought eventually there might be room to 420. But we failed hard. At the 410, I didn't see us giving it back that quickly. Like, that was a crazy give back. You know, by noon, basically gave back all the gains. Tesla yeah. leading the charge down, continues to make new lows. I was tweeting about that right after the open. You can see it. It's going to go red. And then it goes red. And then it makes a new 52-week low. And then it just continues lower here. So, I mean, what's the bull scenario here? The bull scenario is... We continue to be in inflation. Powell is dovish here today and says, yeah, we're going to lay off. But when you really get done, and let's just say, and I want to bring up a chart here too in the overall discussion. Maybe you can bring up this chart, Mitch, that I tweeted out last night. It's from Charlie Balelo, who's a great follow. Give him a follow. Uh, but show the chart here, Mitch, and then we'll discuss You know what he's showing in this chart, which Mitch is bringing up here right now. All right. So the big thing here is, of course, he's talking about current market expectations for Fed fund rates moving forward. Yes. Make the image a little bit bigger here and let Dennis dive deeper into the graphic here. What do you see there? Yeah, Dennis? still not seeing it. It's just seeing oh, the charts. That's, that's, uh, that's, I shared the, the screen, but all right. Just give me one second here. He's going to get it because I want to. Yeah, I wanna no, they, they adjusted this. something here on, on, on StreamYard today. So you know how I got a little confused. There it is. There we go. Okay, so Boom. from Charlie Bellillo, um on Twitter, Charlie, great job. He's always a, a great follow. Uh, current market expectations for the path of the Fed funds rate. Just reading from his tweet. Tomorrow, mm-hmm. which is today, 50 basis point hike. We're getting 50 today. It's, it's 50 is happening. Then they're saying February 25, March 25, and then a pause. And then rate cuts starting in November 2023. This is what you know expectations are. 
for the Fed funds rate. They're expecting them to start cutting rates in late 2023. My yeah. question is, why are they going to start cutting rates? Why are we assuming that just because we start to get inflation in check, we all of a sudden start bringing rates back down? Why are we assuming that? I think I think it's going to be correct. I think one thing I want to say before I go into this whole argument, I actually mm-hmm. think this path is going to be correct. But I think there's going to be a big reason why they're going to start cutting rates in late 2023. And that's because stocks are in a hard recession, not a soft landing. If we go into this this you know bull fairy tale world where it's going to be a soft landing and you know we're going to be in inflation and stocks can go back to all-time highs. If we go into that bull fairy tale world, why are they lowering rates then? If we're all of a sudden, you know, boom, soft landing, boom, you know, inflation is beat, there's no reason to lower rates. So the only reason they're going to lower rates, this path that bond expectors are expecting, is because something has happened with the economy. If that, if this is the path, it probably means that the economy has started to slow substantially, that we are probably in a recession, that corporate earnings are probably coming down. So if this is the path, none of this is good for stocks. Mm-hmm. So that's my argument is – even if we you know we start beating inflation, let's just say inflation gets beat and the Fed is done. It doesn't mean they're going to start lowering rates right away. Then we're going to start lowering rates when we start to see corporate earnings start to come in, which is not good for stocks. So I'm still sticking with the scenario that 2023 is going to be a bad start, at least the first half for stocks. I think yep. we're going into a recession. I think I don't want to own. So everybody keeps saying, what are you buying? What are you buying? And I'm like, I'm still 50% cash. I didn't do much yesterday. We did some day trades. I thought about selling some stuff into the rip, but I've kind of already sold it all. So I was a little bit early maybe on the sales. Uh, but I don't know. Like, I don't want to take all the risk off in case I'm wrong. So I feel like comfortable at about half cash, half stocks. I'm not bearish enough to just say, if we were sitting in certain stocks, I could tweet out on deer. Stocks that are all-time highs have no business being at all-time highs. So yeah, you like your relative strength and yeah, momentum. But I mean, really. If we're going to go into a recession, I believe we are. This is just my theory. I know nothing. I don't have a crystal ball. So I don't know. Maybe we're going to go. It's going to be a soft landing. We're just going to continue to go higher. But if we're going into a recession, which I believe, why am I going to own any of these stocks? You think deer earnings don't get hit? You think caterpillar earnings don't get hit? I just think none of these stocks. The Dow is like 8% off an all-time high. Like we talk about what a vicious bear market 2022 has been. It really hasn't. Because we bounced back so much in October. I think we're in the gift stage. I think we're in still in this gift stage where the hopium is there and you know we're buying all these value stocks. And yes, value stocks I would like to own over growth stocks. But I'm making a point here. I don't know if I want to own stocks. Still 5.1% for not owning stocks right now. Tied up, tied up some money last week. Maybe a tie up for a little bit. And then, you know, get back in the middle of 2023 when they actually do start lowering rates, because I think they're going to, because I think we're going to be in a recession. So I think you're going to get a better entry point. I don't think stocks are cheap. I know everybody thinks it's been a very bad bear market in 2022. That's only for those high growth names. Like the Teslas have had a horrible year. Yeah, Amazon, which I'm a victim of, you know, because I put some of my my wife's RSP uh, 20 points ago. You know, yeah, some of the technology companies have really been beat up. But there's so many other companies that are sitting up near 52-week highs. I don't understand you know, why I'm going to pay 25 times earnings for Coca-Cola here. I don't understand it. Because it's defensive? Well, I, want to play I think it's just for safety. Yeah. That's what it but, is. But, but safety, Mitch, there, there was no alternative. So when we talk about the safety mm-hmm. trade, people take so long yeah. to learn. So they still think, I've got to be in stock. So I'm going to go safety in Coke. I'm going to go safety in the utilities. I'm going to go safety in the staples. I want to go safety in cash. And it, the growth isn't there. 24, 25 times earnings it just seems, doesn't seem cheap to me. So, again, I'm just making the argument, not saying you sell on dips, but, you know, yesterday, lots of followers, lots of people were selling on the rip. I didn't. I thought there might be more gas in the tank. I was wrong. It doesn't appear to be the gas in the tank. I think you're selling on rips. Well, I mean, of course, uh, this will all well. This might change up by two p.m. Of course, uh, when Jerome Powell, uh, the press release gets put out by the FOMC, and then two thirty, we'll get the conference. And don't miss it, team! Right here on Benzinga, you guys can catch that conference and catch it because uh, for the first time, I'm gonna actually try to jump in there after the conference and give some commentary as it's happening. So 
If you guys want to catch that today, that'll be at 2.30 right here on Benzinga. Um, one thing that I'd state is that I – I feel I understand what you mean that we could get lower and you could get a better entry, but I also understand that this is this is kind of that four quarter rally, and I think what we were expecting was a little bit of a four quarter rally, followed by some declines as the concerns come in for next year. And I think that you're just stating that clearly, Dennis. What the path that we've seen is the path that you're continuing to see is that there's still headwinds out there that come into control. We get we rise the wall of worry, and all of a sudden we hit those headwinds. And when we hit those headwinds, we start trickling right back down. So earnings. The problem is, is the big... though, Mitch, is that we had the rally. We've yeah. had that fourth quarter rally, and it was vicious. And the Dow stocks, it's unbelievable. The Dow in the fourth quarter go from yeah. the, the September low to October. We started on the DIA. If you want to just look at the DIA, you don't have to yeah, look, look at that. 290 yeah. to 341. We're up 15%. We came back and got back two-thirds of the losses. Oh, my gosh, what a gift. And it's just because everybody's got to get in value trades now. The Dow is full of value, and that was the call back in October. But I think you're ringing the register now. I think it was a good call, whoever made that call. you know. But do, do these banks, and the banks are starting to come off here now, um, some of them anyways, not all of them. But, I mean, I don't know if – Goldman Sachs has any business being this close to an all-time high. Morgan Stanley breaking out. Morgan Stanley, you know, is up significantly and not far from all-time highs either. 109.92. Yeah, it's down 10, 12%. But I just think there's, you know, the value isn't as isn't as cheap as it was before. And again, I still like drug stocks. I still think I'd pull back. Those are the ones I want to own in a recession. So I'm still mm-hmm. saying, I'm not saying. I'm not buying some stocks. There are certain pockets of still value here that I would be getting into. We've talked about those drug stocks. But I'm saying overall, you're making a case for, yeah, yeah, stocks are cheap. A lot of them are not. Definitely something to keep in mind. And um, one of those things is there will be some kind of pullbacks, right? I feel like eventually we are going to get some pullbacks. These stocks have had a couple of good months. Uh, especially when you look at like kind of like the XLF, um, that's made a big step up here. Uh, you just mentioned Huge healthcare. healthcare is definitely an area where I feel the strength can continue. Financials and industrials can pull back. I mean, if anything, I feel like they've been moving with just that value type of play. It's not that's necessarily it that they have like a beautiful upside outlook going into 23. It's just valuation making sense. And of course, everyone wanted to make a little bit of a run into December, make a little bit of some gains. And now those gains could soon become sell offs, as of course people take well, their profits. They're crowded longs now. They weren't crowded yeah. before. Back in October, there was the case where, you know, a lot of these names were really beat up and they were may- maybe, you know, shouldn't have got down as low as they did. But Got just it. as much as they were so beat up, some of these are overbought now. So I'm just saying that they're crowded. I would wait for a pullback here. And I'm not saying I'm buying tech. What I'm saying is I'm just kind of selling stocks. I just don't want to own stocks here. So, you know what's one thing I on started rallies, hearing? On rallies. Yesterday, yeah. Dennis, I felt like everyone started getting way too fast into hopium and starting to think that even that the Fed is going to turn dovish today. Do you feel that the Fed's going to turn dovish today? I think he'll stand – I think – I, I don't think he's going to turn dovish, but what they interpret as dovish might be, you know, this market mm. looks for any silver lining whatsoever. So if yeah. he says anything about, yeah, you know, we might slow down. They're like, oh, he's dovish. He's got a oh. pivot. <laughs> a slowdown is not a pivot. And mm-hmm. I think the market will eventually realize that. And I think the market, when the dust settles here, there is a lot of damage that has been done. We just haven't seen the damage take place yet because people had a lot of savings. People had a lot of credit card debt that's now soaring. And they haven't got to a point where they've had to slow down their spending yet. It takes time. I think it does show up in 2023. It might not show up in the first quarter, in the first quarter earnings, that is, because they lagged. It's quarter behind. So the fourth quarter, maybe people are still spending. But I think eventually in 2023, it starts to show up in corporate earnings. And I think spending starts to go down. So I think you're seeing it in stocks like Tesla as well. And again, 
Um, you know, we should talk about Tesla because this led the charge down yesterday. I mean, multiple contraction here has been nothing short of incredible. We're talking about a stock that is actually trading 29 times forward earnings. Um, to CNBC's point, the stock has never been that cheap on a fundamental basis. But with that being said, it's also being valued on earnings that, you know, you think are going to continue to, you know, just fly up. The growth is eventually going to slow in Tesla. And then the question is, how much damage is he doing to the brand? Um, you know, I was talking to my wife. She's always wanted a Tesla. And she was saying yesterday, I was like talking about Tesla. She's like, I would never buy a Tesla now because just the stuff he says. And I'm like, I, it, if this is, you know, some people, you know, and not saying it's everyone, but some people, yeah. I don't know if you could say some people, but some people might have that opinion. Yeah. Um, some then investors all of a sudden, even that's have scary. that opinion, right? Not even just some people, some investors might have that opinion, which is even that's scarier, scary, right? Thought. It's a scary thought if he's actually starting to hurt the brand because mm -hmm. that is what Tesla is. I mean, it trades with the yep. crazy multiple, multiple has come in, but it trades with the nosebleed multiple because he's got the brand. I mean, if he starts all of a sudden hurting that brand with too many tweets, and you don't know, he's like, you don't know what he's, yeah. I don't think he said too much bad yet. It's the concern that what he might say. That's what I'm concerned about. What if he goes off and just, you know, on a tangent and says one thing, just a little off. This cancel culture, you know how bad the cancel culture is, Mitch. You cannot say, yeah. you know, one little thing. One little thing. You could say a 10,000 things. If you say one little thing that, you know, offends a group, you're done. So, I mean, he is a little bit, you know, he speaks his opinion. So there is a real risk that the market could cancel him just by him speaking his opinion. And then Tesla really gets hurt. This Twitter deal is possibly the worst thing ever for Tesla stock. So that's the scary thing about Tesla. I'm scared of Musk. I'm scared what he might say. And it's still not a cheap stock. Yes, it's cheap well, relative to itself, but it's still not cheap when you look to other automotives. So for that reason, I'm not looking for you know buying the stock anytime soon. Yeah, it's just how it goes to show you that sometimes talking can hurt you and sometimes talking can help you, right? I feel like this is a perfect example for Elon. For a long time, talking about you know Tesla and uh, giving you know his his you know, growth outlooks help the company for a long time. And now that he's talking and he's mo mainly, it seems like the focus is in Twitter right now, Tesla's taking the hit. And a lot of that talk is not on what Tesla it's on Twitter, political, different areas where it's not to focus on Tesla. So I think that, that if there's anything that we need to start seeing maybe coming out of Elon is more focus going towards the cyber truck, and the semi, because those, I think, are the growth drivers here for Tesla. Tesla's market share isn't going to be growing massively, I think, in EVs continuing because there's so many comp competitors stepping in. That's exactly so at this it point, too. it needs to be yeah. what's the next growth driver. So it needs to be the semi. It needs to be the cyber truck. Those need to be successful, really, to kind of keep giving Tesla the valuation that everyone wants to give it as a tech company versus an auto company, right? And the risk still is the brand. I mean, the brand is everything. So there's a lot of reasons not to own Tesla here. The only reason to own it is that it is cheap relative to itself. And you believe that, you know, somehow T Musk is going to muzzle himself, which, you know, it's not very easy because we know when he didn't own Twitter, Twitter could muzzle him. But I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared of what Twitter. he possibly might no say. Longer. I love Elon Musk. I think he's, you know... and maybe not so much the person, but I love his mind. I believe he's one of the best innovators we've had in so long from PayPal to SpaceX. The stuff he does in SpaceX is nothing short of incredible to Tesla. I'm a huge Elon Musk fan, but I'm really scared that he's going to say something and the cancel culture is going to get him. I'm really scared of that. And that's what would keep me out of Tesla stock here too. Please, Elon, if you're listening, just be very careful when you're tweeting. I like it that you're tweeting. But I'm just scared that you might say something that might offend a lot of people. Yeah, because, you know, Elon likes to jump in his Tesla and listen to us in the car. You know, uh, I, I hear you, Elon. I hear you. All right, let's get into the action. Let's get out of that. Uh, Goldman Sachs did, though, just to kind of state um, to get out of Tesla so we don't have to go back towards it. They did sure. do a price 
a cut on Tesla's price target. It was at 305. They lowered it down to 235. But that's still Everybody's ways away from here. price now. Yeah, just they're chasing all, it. They're all dead wrong. Let's cut they $30. Let's cut wrong. $70. And well, they're they all, need to maybe We should cut. just go. Can you go to the Benzinga Pro and see where all the price targets are? Show us, Mitch. Yeah, go let's to the do Pro. That. Bring it up. Go to the ratings. Bring up Tesla. And let's look at the price targets because they're all ridiculous. Yeah, so this is, I'm going to go this up there, a, too. I'm going good. to my Benzinga right, Pro so as we're well. Pulling up it's nice and go Tesla back. Tesla here, of course. We can go to the calendar. And then let's go to analyst ratings. You guys can see price targets here on the right-hand side. Make sure we have this lined up by date. Yeah, we do. And you guys can see here. Look can how you blow it up how, at all? I might, yeah, I, I'm, I'm like, going to blow it up just for the target. I'm trying to get closer to the screen. I got you guys. I'll, I'll scroll to the right here. Uh, make sure yeah. that we can fit it in. I'm just um, curious of these price targets. He's going to make it even bigger for me because yeah, I'm half here, blind. I got you. No Getting worries. old, Mitch. I don't know when I got so old. You know, it just happened. It, it, it like happens, overnight. my friend. It happens. I know. I don't know why. Happens it happens to the best though. of us, man. Okay, he's gonna make it bigger for me again. So we can, or you can just read me these price targets. But come on, I mean, I know majority of analysts have buys. There's probably some sales out there too. But what are these price targets? Boom. All right. I think that's big enough now for you here. Okay. Scroll down. <laughs> All right. So now we got Goldman it here. down to two thirty-five. Two thirty-five. City. Oh my is probably gosh. The best the one. Targets. Citigroup, got to give you a shout out. 176. At least you're kind of in line in the with, where the price action is. Everyone yeah. else, look, Morgan Stanley, 330. Deutsch, 355. Deutsch, oh. I don't know what you are. Uh, you're seeing too much Santa Claus, maybe. Wedbush, even 300. Our buddy Dan Ives, who comes Dan the Ives, show. we're going to have to get him on the show. We're going to have to reach out to him. This These has to all... change. 300. Look at the price targets. They're so off. Well, uh, Fargo is at least at. 230 morgan stanley 350 yeah th this is off guys and, and going, it just goes to going. show you 400 that, deutsche you know. bank <laughs> piper sandler 340 this does anybody goes to have a us. sell who has a sell on this thing oh i don't think anybody does to tell you there's the gotta be a couple cells still out there you yeah the maybe some let, let's uh, i'll zoom back so i can get towards the cell uh, normally, I just put my rating here. Anyways, Let's... these price targets are ridiculous. You know what's going to happen? They're all going to so... lower their price targets, and I'll put more pressure on the stock. So there is some sells. There is oh, a, a Citigroup sell here. A Citigroup. Citigroup has, uh, I think, a sell on it right now. Um, okay, so, so there you go. Here. Citigroup, at least, it seems like they're in line. And this uh, Italy guy... Uh, we might have to bring them on. We're gonna have to reach out to Citigroup. Zoltan, reach out. We want to get Citigroup on. All anyway, right. Well, so so where we, where we're talking just is that everybody is too bullish, and this is for all stocks. Everybody's too yeah. bullish, and I think some of the expectations need to come down on the individual stocks. Maybe they can put their price targets, you know, on the S and P at like four thousand or forty two hundred. But I think the S and P is going nowhere for the next year. Start lowering price targets on individual stocks. So I. The concern again with Tesla, I believe the brand could has the potential to be tarnished quickly with Musk, which I'm scared of. It's still it's cheap relative to itself, but it's still expensive overall. And I mean there's bag holders all over the place here. The new lows, you gotta go everywhere. New yep, lows, make a new you lows. Right go. to their old rule. Make a new fifty two week low, you gotta go. Don't own stocks, make new fifty two week lows. I'd sell we had a ripper three days ago. You're selling any type of strike. And that's nope. what people are doing. Every time this gets a little bit of a pop, it's selling. That's just my opinion. I have no position in Tesla. I've been bearish for a long time and wrongfully bearish all the way up, rightfully bearish on the way down. I'd said if it got to 100 bucks, but now I'm scared of the whole Musk thing. So I don't know. I'm Right now, I'm just out, laying off. As long if if Musk can you know stop tweeting as much and it's, there's no risk, and if you know nobody ever, ever nobody else starts making EVs, which we know everybody's going to start making EVs, I think there's the good bull case that this stock could get a lot of these losses back. But I don't think that's the case. I think competition is coming. I'm scared of Musk, and the stock still isn't cheap. So for all, all those right. reasons, no thank you. Let's move forward to Delta here, as Delta expects 23 earnings to nearly double due to what they're calling robust travel demand. Um, they're seeing that their earnings per share can nearly double to as much as $6 per share next year above analyst estimates, forecasting 15 to 20% jump in revenue next year and free cash flow rising to more than $2 billion 
uh, next year to more than four billion in 2024. This is, a, of course, a turnaround from in 2020 when Delta posted a record loss. And uh, CEO stating that demand for air travel remains robust as we exit the year. <coughs> Delta's momentum is building. I'm excited to talk a little bit about the airlines coming up with our guests. But what do you think about Delta here as it's starting to get a nice little push? I'm not it's sure not the market area. believes it. And, you know, the airlines have had decent earnings. We heard JetBlue not so great yesterday. But I'm, and I think that's why Delta probably comes out here today because they see JetBlue exactly. uh, saying not so bullish stuff. And they're like, well, we're going to defend ourselves. We don't know. Said, we think the earnings are going to double. I, mean, <laughs> I stated this yesterday. Their mouths? Where are they coming <laughs> up with this? Like, are, well, are they, they I mean, think interest rates don't affect, you know, they think interest rates don't affect their business. People travel more when they have less money. I they're disagree still getting, with everything they're here. They're still getting the travel demand. I think that's they're still finding that way. And they, so well, sure unless they are. there's huge demand destruction coming through in travel, which we haven't seen yet, that, that'd be the only coming, change, though. right? You I still think, it's, think coming. it's coming. I'm still of the theory Blue Putnam's going to be on here tomorrow. I think it just takes time. And I okay. think the demand destruction will come for it. I think the business travel isn't coming as back as hard as it was. I think everybody's had this bonus. We were all tied up for a year and a half, and now we want to get out and do stuff. And I think they're still doing that to a certain extent. I think that slows substantially in 2023. I think Delta will be wrong. So I, uh, I, you know, I'm not saying you know that this is, but you got some resistance up here at 36. If we're just doing the technicals here, I yep. think I'm fading this move. I just say watch 36. That's my right? opinion. You can start closing above 36. This doesn't look bad at all. And at least I would say that if the one positive that I see maybe happening next year is oil prices maybe continuing to drop. If oil prices continue to drop, these stocks should get a little bit of a lift. We'll have to wait and see. Delta but oil not prices have dropped. I mean, yeah, yeah oil stocks. Yeah, I mean, it's still expensive, oil though. 70s, have not, 70s is still expensive. Oil stocks have not dropped, but oil prices have. And we know there's that disconnect because of the multiple mm -hmm. expansion. As much as we see multiple contraction, Tesla, we see the multiple expansion in all the oil stocks because these are trade four or five, six times. I mean, they're just too dang cheap. But, you know, mm -hmm. oil prices have come in. So do we think oil is just going to continue to go down? Well, if it continues to go down, it's because we went into recession. And if we go into recession, it's not good for business travel, too. I just can't. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. Everybody thinks, yeah, we're going to get everything. All these prices going to, you know, it's all going to be good. And we're yeah. going to have a soft landing. And interest rates are going to get cut next year. We're going to have interest rate cuts. But we're going to go into a full expansion. It does well, not up. The Fed isn't going to just start cutting rates because, you know, and again, we already went into this conversation. But it's going to be cut for fun. They're going to cut for a reason. And that reason is going to be that we're going into a recession. That's what I predict. I may be wrong. Maybe we're going to that, you know, like I said, rainbows and everything, and it's going to be all-time highs. This bull case scenario, the soft landing happens for the first time, you know, after they've raised rates from 0% basically to almost 5 to 4.5, and, and we're going to go into a soft It just doesn't add up. The math doesn't add up, but maybe Wall Street math doesn't always have to add up, and maybe there's a path to all-time highs. I am not betting that way. All right, let's keep moving forward. We will get our guest on in just about five minutes here. Let's take a look at some other ratings that are out there. There's a couple of them. Uh, let's go to one that I saw moving uh, stock this morning. We haven't talked about this one in a while is QuantumScape. Goldman Sachs uh, doing a little bit of a rating change and uh, QuantumScape continuing to go down. So this just goes to show us that you know some stocks, yeah, some stocks have come back, but some stocks that have that growth outlook like a quantum scape oh, uh, prior SPAC, not turning around anytime soon. So we got to be careful on stocks like this. A uh, lot they of these put it to are sell potentially and lowered $5. I don't follow the company closely, but I just look at the chart. We see a stock go from 120 to seven or to six now, 666. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times they continue the path lower. I don't know if the lower is zero or one or two, but it's hard to turn these stories around. So there is going to be some turnaround stories here, but you know how many EV companies are. Is this EV? Quantumscape EV? This is battery. This is battery. But it's, but it's it's batteries, but it's EV. Yeah, EV. So EV there's a hundred of these companies. There's going to be like five winners and probably 95 losers. So pick your you know stocks. You can, maybe you've got the, maybe you think this is the one, but I'm just telling you a majority of these companies Probably are not going to make it. 
So there's a lot more, you know, pain ahead. I think we're going to see some bankruptcies in 2023. I'm not sure if QuantumScape is at stock. But I'm not going to make this mass bet that they're all going to be winners because they can't all be winners. There's not enough. That pie is not big enough for all of these stocks to just be winners. And the market caps they were trading at 2021 never made any sense. So I don't, you know, this is one I just stay away from. My opinion. All right, team. Uh, 830 numbers are going to come in in just a second. You'll get import uh, price index uh, came in at 0.6. Uh, loss of 0.6 versus the loss of 0.5 estimate. So I don't see too much moving off of that, but just wanted to go ahead and state it so that okay. we definitely covered that economic data that hits today. There's import price index and export price index that's cool. hitting. It's not moving the markets too much, but just wanted to go ahead and make sure that we covered it. Um, there is a stock that has a buy rating, which is plug power. Someone stepping up to the plate in plug power getting it a little bit of a lift here, UBS initiating coverage and announcing a price target of $26. Plug Power, of course, kind of more of that hydrogen model. Mm. Um, I think this one's even further out than the other ones, but I don't know. That's yeah, just my like opinion. That's I don't the problem see hydrogen. burning cash. I mean, I'd love to be bullish, and I do own some Ballard Power. Bag holder for Ballard Power, terrible, should sell it. I it's in my RSP, so I don't even get the tax loss benefit from it. Um, but I guess it's all not taxed. I mean, so there's Ballard, Plug Power, and FCEL. They've all been massive dogs. I had a speculative position of Ballard Power down like 60%. Man. Should have sold it before. Uh, so bag holding here. Plug Power, um, it's the same. They're, they're all similar businesses here. And I don't know if the turnaround story is going to happen or not. They've had moments. Where And I do think Plug Power out of the three is probably the best one. But again, it's hard to buy these companies now that are burning cash. The stories were cool a year ago. Stories don't make money, though. Money makes money. And they're just not, you know, obviously in a situation where I don't know if there's path to profitability here anytime soon. We'll have Sorry to about wait the stuffiness. See. Long COVID forever here. Nah, you're fine. I'm just telling the chat that we stated earlier in the week, Joel will be back tomorrow. Don't worry about Joel. He'll be back tomorrow. It's just taking a couple of days. All right. I'm probably last... going to get rid of that Ballard Power eventually. I've had it for like a year. I'm probably just going <laughs> to eat Don't worry. Last. Don't worry. Take I the got... last five bucks and move on. <laughs> I got mine. I got mine that I'm hanging on. My genie. Yeah, we all got some bags. <laughs> My I wish, genie. I wish we could be My right genie. 100% of the time. <laughs> We all got maybe if I rub the lamp the right way. You still got GD? Go. You still on that one? <laughs> yeah, man. It's the the, the tax benefit now, right? <laughs> that's know, what happens when you buy what and hold. Tells us. I love those buy Bitwise hold, commercials, right? I love those Bitwise commercials that endlessly pumped crypto in our face. The diversified crypto portfolio, which we oh. told you on the show was a very bad idea. Yeah, they weren't. And the only ones. you know they pump it, pump it. Now they're talking about hey. But you know what the benefit is? Is tax write-offs they're talking about now in the Bitwise commercials. And that's one thing to know about crypto. Holy mackerel, man. That Bitwise. Ugh. Anyways, sorry, well, Bitwise. I'll get us out of I this. Just, so, I'll the endless back. promotions on CNBC of Bitwise, the, the diversified crypto portfolio, I just I cringe at it. And now they're telling me to write my losses off after you've endlessly promoted all year. Ridiculous. Eh, it's how it is. And that's why I tried to state uh, about it yesterday on my show that I feel like at the end of the day, SBF is going to get what he deserves. But he's also a little bit of a scapegoat because there's a lot of a lot of kind of investments there that came out in cryptocurrencies that were promising this, promising that and really weren't getting actually those returns. So yeah. you got to be careful with that type of model. But let's get out of this. Let's stop talking about uh, kind of what we've been on. We, we just covered some ratings. We did Tesla. We talked some Delta. Let's get to our guests and let's get into some of Zach's investment research. If you guys haven't checked out Zach's investment research before, I definitely recommend it. They have a good free trial um, and this could give you uh, like 30 days to really check out what they have to offer. What I really like about them is that they have an ability of ranking stuff from value, growth, and kind of momentum. Different areas, right? And areas where I try to pay attention. Is this value? Is it good on value? Is it good on growth? Does it have momentum? And then combining all three of those is definitely important. But let's get Ducks to it. Row. 
Tracy Rynex, Senior Equity Strategist, Zach Investment Research. How are we doing today, Tracy? It's good to have you back on. Thanks for having me. And I'm sad that Joel isn't on today because... He, I know, I know you were gonna, oh goodness, so blue he dressed up for Joel. So blue. I did. I'll he's tell you, I'll tell you right now. Though. He watches, so <laughs> he's I'm jumping sure around he's right now. He's like, <laughs> go blue, go blue. That's right. <laughs> Definitely. There's a lot to celebrate good. this year. We might as well go all out, right? Yeah, I mean, this is the big year, right? I think last year was the test, and this is the year that they finally get through. We'll That's see what right. happens there. And I, yeah. I know Joel won't be, he, he, trust me, I've already talked to him. He won't be missing out, Tracy. He'll be there. <laughs> He'll be there. All right, let's get towards the action. Of course, lately, it feels like it's been a change in the trend. 2020 brought all the growth traders out there. And it seems like we've gone into a prolonged trend of value over growth. Do you think that this could stick going into next year? Yeah, definitely. Uh yeah, I, th I feel like a lot of people are still kind of poking around in a lot of the growth names. And that's normal because it, it has had a big run, you know, over a decade now. And so people tend to just want to stay in what has been working. Right. And why not? You know, if yeah. you own Tesla for the last six or seven years, I heard you talking about them. Yeah. Then you're still you're probably still a believer in it. But I've seen this story before, saw what happened in 2000 to 2002. And um, I feel like the value that is uh, starting to rally here and things like energy that has been on top for two years, those other areas will rally when everyone else isn't really still paying attention. They still want the old names to come back. And it's gonna take you know maybe even another year before people realize, hey, that might not be where I need to be. So, yeah. So you Value's think this value cool. rally could just be getting started, Tracy? or Because it's been yeah. going on for about a year now, really. We've seen this separation, especially though in the last two months. I mean, really pronounced in the last two months where the Dow has had this ridiculous rally, up 15% in the last month and a half. And all the growth names, the Kathy names, are still kind of sitting down near the lows. So we are starting to see separation. Do you think you have more path for the separation to continue in 2023? Yeah, definitely. Uh, most of the value are pretty cheap here because some of them have sold off too, but just not as severely. It depends on what area you're looking at. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I definitely think the money is going to rotate in probably also into small cap value, which could mean a lot of the small banks over 20% of most of the small cap value indexes are financials, which you know includes more than the banks, but a lot of them are the banks. But right now, banks are out of favor, <laughs> yeah. right? With uh, you know everything going on with the Fed, even as the Fed continues to raise, everybody thinks the Fed is going to start cutting at some point next year, possibly, and then that's bad for the banks, right? So the banks have never really, not yet, gotten the rally I thought they would deserve on the Fed. Uh, raising this aggressively because they, they, they kind of things. did and then they gave it back in the last right. couple of weeks so is this a yeah. buying opportunity i mean look at bank america it went from 29 right. to 39 in a month right. but now it's all the way back at 32 wells fargo yeah. similar story going up from yep. 40 to 48 and back to 42 is this just a buying opportunity for the banks and, and full disclosure it's actually the banks is something that i'm looking at too i have a couple of them I have a couple yeah, of Canadian banks, but but then again, I get a little bit scared if we go into recession. It's not good for the banks. So, give me your bank bull case, and which banks do you like the best? Um, I am a big fan on the big banks of Bank of America. I do like some of the regionals a little bit more, and even those small banks. I own uh, this really small bank called Old Second Bank Core. What's the um, And they're in one. Chicago. They're like the they're from like 1890 or something. They're the third largest bank in Chicago now. There it is. And they are going to be a big beneficiary of the rise in, uh, you know, what the Fed is doing, raising the rates, and it's going to go right to earnings for them. So finally, for, for most of this year, it was going nowhere. But finally, someone is 
figured out, yeah, their earnings are actually going to rise on what the Fed is doing here. And the shares were cheap. So uh, I like, but the small banks, I basically go off of whatever bank analysts I can find who covers them and what they recommend because there's so many of them. I mean, literally, if you go uh, to the Zach's number one ranks, a lot of banks are on the, the number one rank list that we have. And I would say uh, several dozen. And you just kind of look at the list and you're like, okay, what, what determines which bank and what do I look at? But really, I do encourage people to look at what is in their, their own area. Where do they bank? <laughs> like, what, what do they know about what their own banks are doing? Then go do a little bit further research on them. Not all banks will benefit from the NIM, you know, the net interest margin. Some will have better NIM than others. That's where I turn to the bank analysts who put out lists of, you know, who they think will have the best uh, NIM results, basically. Um, and Old Second Bank Corps is one of those. Comerica actually is one of those two, big Texas bank, but also in Michigan. And um, but nobody's like Comerica. Take a look at that chart. It's terrible. Yeah, it's killed. It's awful. But yeah, the why, yield, why, why is this one not participated at all? Um, I don't know because don't their know. earnings have There's not an opportunity been here. Yeah, like it's I don't know. Uh, and they're in states that should do a little bit better, perhaps on uh, you know some kind of recession scenario. At least I. I consider Texas to probably have a good anchor, even in a recession. And you could say, oh, maybe they're worried about energy. A lot of Texas banks do have energy exposure. I don't I don't know exactly what Comerica's is, but I'm assuming they have some. But mm -hmm. energy's not the problem right here. They're they're rolling in the money over there. So mm -hmm. I don't know. But it's now yielding about four percent for Comerica here. So I do like the yields on a lot of the banks, too. So the One, banks, I thought this year would be a year we would see a big rally in the banks, but the street still hates some. So maybe next year it could be the time, but that's in the value category for sure. Yeah. And if the small banks really catch a bigger bid here, then you're going to see those small cap value indexes really take off in 2023. Well, let's move away from the financials. You did mention energy. What other value uh, sectors, this is stock sectors, do you like here? I mean, obviously, there's been some some winners. It hasn't been a bad 2022 for all stocks, but there's been a lot of losers, too. Do you find value anywhere else? Yeah. Well, I still do like energy, but I would maybe move away from the producers and start looking at oil field services like the Halliburton, Slumberjays, yeah. any of those companies. Those earnings look really good going into next year because... Uh, you know, with the higher energy prices, even though they've come back down, the global companies, global drillers are starting to invest again. This is how what happens in the cycle. And that's going right to the earnings of Schlumberger. Halliburton looks good for this year. Also for next year, they're all they're cheap, uh, you know, still with decent PEs. They pay dividends, uh, not as not as juicy as the producers right now, but free ca cash flows are improving for all these on the services side. So take a look at services. Um, I also still do like you were talking about electric vehicles earlier. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of like the battery makers or those as you were talking, but I am a big fan of the lithium producers that mm. goes into the battery. Yeah. And they don't have enough of it. The price has tripled this year. It, uh, you know, we'll we'll see what happens going forward. A lot of production has been increased. The big producers are increasing. Um, I think Albemarle just announced, you know, further expansion of like a research facility in North Carolina. Um, that's secret ALB. Yeah. That, that chart looks interesting. It is one of the ones that's in the green for this year. Yeah, it's um, hard to find those. Yeah, it is. It's been a little rocky, as you can see, kind of, you know, a little volatile. It does tend to move with energy for some reason, maybe because it's more on the commodity side. But, uh, you know, I, I, it's still cheap. I, I like this type of area because for the next couple of years, you know, I just heard General Motors say that they're going to 
be producing a million electric vehicles by 2025, just in the United States alone. And all I can think of is where are they going to get the lithium? <laughs> Where's yeah. it going to come from? Yeah. Is like, ALB all the biggest one? Electric vehicles. Is ALB the biggest one? Like there's, I'll, I follow the three LAC, lithium, LTHM, which I own, full disclosure. I've had it in the yeah. for about two years now. And um, ALB is the other one. Is ALB the biggest one? It, you know? In the United States, but the, United the biggest States. producer that's publicly traded is SQM. Yeah, I'm not say yeah the that's name. it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can't say the name ever. There it is. <laughs> yeah. 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 They got I consonants where there should be vowels. Chile. Yeah. Chile. Yeah. That's what exactly. you got to know. Yeah, it's um, I own like it in my own personal portfolio uh, uh, for this like one it. because it does. it is paying the big dividends and 8%. it also – is on fertilizers so it's not just i think it actually shows up as a fertilizer on sax.com uh, yeah. because it does produce potash which mm -hmm. i like right now too even though the potash prices have come down i do think potash is also in a bull market so you kind of get the the dual thing here what exactly. one thing people should know about sqm if they're not aware of it is that um it is paying into like a kind of a special windfall profit tax in chile because things have just been too good. So they're spreading the wealth among Chileans. <laughs> but even with that, they're still paying a pretty sizable variable dividend, at least this year, because lithium prices have tripled and they've been able to renegotiate their older contracts. Uh, but this is a question. They are increasing production. They're one of the few that can do that. But even when they do that, how much, you know, the demand is just going to outpace even what they're able to do. But I, I still like this one. It hasn't done much in the last couple of months. And it, it too, moves with energy for whatever reason. But like shares it. are still pretty cheap. Yeah, I like any of these lithium plays. So I guess commodities. Um, there are some retailers that are dirt cheap right now. But oh, yeah, you better that. have a strong stomach for these. What, what are you looking at? Um, well... I, I've, I've been talking with some people about like the big apparel retailers like G3 okay. and PVH, but I don't know. Like, I, I feel like it's just a little too early to get into that. I mean, we're not even in a recession and that this is always one of the first things to go. You just won't buy the clothes if, right. you know, you lose your job or whatever. So, but I'm I'm kind of keeping these on my watch list because they're gonna they could go a lot cheaper before you know it's all said and done, and you might be able to get some deals on some of these. Some of the bigger, uh, like more specialty retail, are interesting, but they haven't pulled back that much. You know, the Lulus, the Ultas, the those big winners outside of apparel. Well, Lulu is apparel too, but that's athleisure, so a little different. But um, you know, I own both of those, but I'm not adding my position. I feel like they're a little pricey here for for this market. Um, so yeah, retail, it's it's always a tough one, <laughs> but I'm keeping an eye on it. Another one that's also interesting that doesn't get a lot of uh, buzz is Oxford Industries. They own Lily Pulitzer and Tommy Bahama. And um both are doing outstanding. Both of those brands, they're not having to be super promotional. I think I've seen like 20% off so far during the holiday season. That's very good for what's going on out there with the 50, 60% offs. And Tommy Bahama, they got the restaurants with Tommy Bahama. I don't know if you've ever been to one, super fun. And those are doing double digits uh, comps right now because we all wanna be out there. They announced they're gonna open up a resort Tommy Bahama Resort out in uh, Palm Springs area, out in California, which makes sense. They have a bunch of restaurants out there already. And so they're kind of going into this hospitality area, similar to RH, which opened that guest house up. And RH is doing who knows what else. I expect some more hotels type of stuff from RH as well. But Oxford Industries, two strong brands, but people don't really talk about them. So and this is a cheap stock and they pay a dividend. So, yeah, there is a lot of value out what, there. What if, and, and all these scenarios, 
what if we do go into a recession in 2023? What if there is not the soft landing? Because I automatically think, like you, your point, the retailers, I'm like, yeah, you're going to recession. I don't know yeah. about that. Yeah. I'm like, the banks, well, maybe some of them are cheap enough. Maybe they can handle a recession. You know, maybe the energy stocks still hold up in a recession here. What if we do go into a recession? What happens to, you know, all of these trades? Um, you're going to get it cheaper for sure. I'm yeah. keeping some firepower on the sidelines in case – we do you do. think we're going into a recession or do you think we get the soft landing? Um, I think all, all the flags indicate that we will see a recession, but I do think it's not going to be, you know, the deep, severe thing everybody's fearing. I think we've seen, we saw the crazy pandemic recession. Then we had the great financial crisis. So yeah. we've kind of gotten used to these very severe events. But going back again to like the early 2000s, I remember that recession. I was out in Silicon Valley for it. It was, it did get hit hard out in Silicon Valley during that one because it was a dot com bust. But it wasn't, uh, and then we had 9 11, which exasperated what was already going on. But it wasn't like the Great Recession. Like I got laid off, but I didn't have to wait, you know, two years to find a new job like some people had to at the later one. So I just think we all kind of are pricing in similar events to what we just experienced, but we're not going to have it be that, uh, that bad. There's a lot of things in the economy that, you know, you, you have to like right now, including that there still are 10 million job openings. That's good right. and bad. Right. But there still is demand for the labor out there that we still have. You guys were talking about travel and the airlines. There's still not enough pilots. Um, I'd be, you know, I would tell someone to be an airline mechanic there's like new schools opening up to train airline mechanics, um, you know, nurses, there's not nearly enough nurses. And so while some of the demand has come down for the nurses, now that mm -hmm. we aren't having quite as bad of uh, and as big of outbreaks of COVID right now, the nurses salaries for the traveling nurses have come down, but not that much because there's still a shortage. And those baby boomers, both the pilots, mechanics, nursing like they are finally retiring and that's creating this hole that a lot of people always thought would be there in the US economy but now we are facing it so there's some of these things that i feel will be um you know put a floor under the economy when we do actually you know see the bigger slowdown and possibly go into that recession all right, now let's go into a little bit of Zach's research. And I did catch that you guys have Jinko Solar as a number one rated VGM. Of course, explain to us what does it mean for a number one rated VGM? And for those that don't know the Zach's ranking system, of course, and how do you feel about the call in the solar stock? I like solar here. That's an area that's cheap. I've been in and out of it for like the last 10 years, probably as everybody has. Um, you know, I was looking at some old portfolios from 2008 from that presidential election, actually. And we had like some solar stocks in there. It could have even been Jinko Solar. Um, you know, they, they've been around a while. Uh, but I do feel like those earnings are starting to turn around. That's when you get like the number one rank is when the analysts are starting to raise those earnings estimates. And then they're all in agreement. Things look better here. These stocks are dirt cheap. And I think because no one really believes that we might finally see something good going on with them, with the, with the share prices, it's just, it's been a long slog if you've been in these. I don't know anyone who's managed to stay in it since 2008 kind of thing. Well, like you crazy just moves. Happened. Yeah, you, you just haven't been able to. And then a lot of them are related to China you know, um, what's going on over there, uh, supply chain issues. And then over the years, we've seen like changes in, you know, solar policy by countries like Germany. And then even here, we, we did give tax credits for people putting on the solar panels. So that helps some of these stocks. And, but, um, you know, if you're in a long-term bear, eventually maybe you come out of it. They do a lot of these companies have positive earnings again. So I I, I kind of like the solar area. I'm glad you brought it up as like a dark horse area for, for this coming year because they are cheap. 
Yeah, trying to find some relative strength, I guess. Uh, then we all need to kind of maybe find where we can find yeah. our little pockets of relative strength. Something that we'll definitely be watching is the expectations of earnings going into 23. Do you see contraction uh, showing up? And will that give us any light on the recession concerns? Um. Well, for right now, earnings are still expected to be a uh, positive for 2023 they have come down off their april highs the analysts have been cutting over the last six months obviously uh, but still expected to see a little bit of gain over what we're seeing here in 2022 i think it's like 2.8 percent is what we have right now uh that's not too bad the first couple quarters expected to be in the negative but then turning around in the second half of the year but just because you have a decline in earnings doesn't mean the same thing is actually happening in GDP because they measure different things. So, and we are coming off of, you know, extremely strong earnings during the pandemic. And so it wouldn't be surprised to see that slow quite a bit here. So it's not really going to tell you about the recession. The thing you need to look at is unemployment. What's happening with that? Watch those weekly jobless claims. And then um, obviously the monthly reports. But once you see those weekly jobless claims start to go up over 300,000, that's when it's a little bit of a key there that we could be heading into the recession then that, you know, so watch, watch employment really for the recession. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. Tracy Reinick from Zach's and you guys check out Zach's investment research for yourself. You guys can go ahead and go to it. Just Zach's.com. Simple as that. Appreciate you coming on today, Tracy. Thank you guys. Have a good holiday. Thanks, Tracy. All right. Let's take a, a quick little peek into the market as we start wrapping up. It's 857. We're getting yeah. close towards the open here. What are you seeing, Dennis? Uh, just chop here. Just um, chop, obviously right? now we are the waiting game to see what the Fed is going to say. Let's see what Powell is going to say. You know, let's see exactly what's going to happen. We're going to get the 50. You know, I'm, I'm fairly confident. I think it's a foregone conclusion. We're getting the 50. It's a commentary going forward that the market's going to be interested in. So, um, that's what the market's waiting for. Um, do they find the silver lining reason to rally back up? I think I'd be a seller into the strength. I mean, with so much resistance up there, 410 now. I'm like, I don't know. And I don't like the tape from yesterday. I don't like that. You know, it didn't hold the gains on basically the good mm -hmm. news that all the bulls wanted. So it was more like it felt like, you know, everybody was positioned and then, you know, expecting, you know, lower, you know, uh, lower inflation to tick down. And then, you know, we got it and then it just didn't hold the gains. So keep an eye on Tesla as your leader in tech here right now. Tesla could turn around. Maybe the whole market could turn around. Maybe, you know, but there's so many people who are just buried in Tesla here that it's putting pressure on the overall market as well. It's a big part of the S&P becoming a smaller part every day, but it's still a big part of it. So keep an eye on Tesla as one of your leaders, but we're all waiting for the Fed. Yeah, we'll wait for that. And of course, uh, one area I also saw reject that was an important level yesterday was Apple's rejection of 150. Seems like we can't get back above that 150. It's been a fighting zone before on the daily chart. We've seen it multiple times. Now it's kind of rejecting here. You can see from this trend line that I can draw here that it just coming down. It won't get back up towards the 150. I think that's a nice area if you're bullish Apple to start seeing it get back above. But other than that, I'll be looking to see if we cut through yesterday's lows, uh, 144.32. Uh, and 144.24 areas to watch. We'll see if we cut through that on Apple. Of course, I don't think that we'll get much action until the release at 2 p.m. So I wouldn't be expecting too much movement. But you never know, right? We'll see what happens towards the open. Yesterday was just an unfortunate leak all day long. I thought that maybe we could get a little bit of a 3 p.m. rally. And we did get a little bit of a push up, but it was very, very short lived and didn't really get even past the resistance. So we'll see what happens today. Uh, last uh, tickers that we didn't touch, maybe um, there was Datadog, Oppenheimer upgrading Datadog to outperform, announcing a 105 price target. Any thoughts on Datadog before we get out of here, Dennis? Um, some of these companies are actually looking a little healthier. I like the double bottom in the chart. I don't follow the company closely enough to just make money. Does Datadog uh, make money? I, I don't think right now. At, at <laughs> Maybe the past profitability I'll... is a little closer than some of these other stocks. So, I mean, 
you know, you got obviously, you know, you got the takeover there of who got taken over? I forget there. Two days ago. Yeah, it was Merger Monday. Money. Who was it? Merger Monday. Who was it? Um got chat. Got... Koopa, Koopa, Koopa. Koopa. Koopa Troopa. Koopa Troopa got taken over. I mean, so maybe, you know, some of these other ones, they're you know, is there the potential that a data dog or somebody else could get acquired? You know, maybe one of the another cloud name gets acquired. Maybe. Uh, but I'm not sitting around waiting for that. I do think the chart looks like it's trying to bottom overall but i mean you gotta you know obviously that's the huge levels down there at 66 but we're so far off it yeah. now i'm like i don't know if i want to hold that far so you almost gotta wait for pullbacks to get in uh there's there's just easier easier plays out there like data dog the only thing i would say is i did look into the earnings here they don't look bad they do make they are making some money and it's consistent i there's not one they are single money? surprise yeah and there's not one single surprise in the EPS to the downside. All right. upside action to there. Um, so they beat their estimates consistently. What's um, the P on this puppy? 20, point, point two three. Point two three. Uh, the, no, the PE. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I thought you said EPS for some reason. I'm yeah, reading yeah. EPS. Uh, PE right now is it's a, the forward outlook. I don't know if it's right here, but 68 is what we have. Yeah, so you still nosebleed. But you nosebleed. Money. But Maybe the earnings are going to grow to it. I don't know. So it's going to be some winners here. There is going to be some winners, like a Salesforce. You know, should we just go and talk like the big dogs, a Salesforce and Adobe? I mean, they've come down. So Salesforce trade with Ford P at 23 now. Not under a market multiple, but if it gets under a market multiple, maybe a look there. I mean, these are companies that, you know, are, you know, they've been the best of breed for a long time. Salesforce down from 300 to 135. I am still scared. I'm not buying stocks. I believe we're going to recession. If I change that opinion, I will start buying stocks. Uh, Salesforce would be on my shopping list uh, a, a lot of, with a lot of other stocks, but it's more like after, you know, my shopping list I feel like is going to be more mid-2023 where I really load up this 50% cash I feel like I've been carrying forever. I feel like there's going to be a time to get this back into the market. I feel like I want Salesforce a part of it. Maybe there's going to be a data dog or something in there. But, you know, there's also going to be other ones too. We just got to get the timing right. And I just feel like there's too much risk here yet. I feel like the time is not now. All right. We'll wait and see on data dog what happens there. And, of course, what happens in the market today? What will happen with Jerome Powell? 2 p.m. You get the press release. And, of course, the fireworks usually come at the conference, so don't miss it, team. That'll be right here. You guys can catch it on Benzinga. We'll see you tomorrow, Dennis, as we'll have Blue Putnam. Blue, we're my boy, Blue. My boy, my Blue. Boy. We'll have him on tomorrow. Boy. He can't go okay. wrong. Sounds good. See you guys. Have a good one, Dennis. And we'll see, right? One of the things that Blue told us is, of course, the lagging effects. Are the lagging effects starting to come into the environment and the actual economy? Something that I'll be asking Blue Putnam tomorrow. Don't miss a team. Up next, you guys got some live trading action. And then after that, we will have an alt investment show. Check that out. Brand new to you. I'll be starting up at 11 a.m. Eastern. But live trading coming on next. Hit the thumbs up and I will see you guys right over. You don't got to go anywhere. This will redirect you to live trading. Hit the thumbs up if you guys enjoyed today's show and, of course, our interview.